Great words those, aren't they? Yet not I, but Christ in me. Lovely to be with you this morning. A great privilege and a great honor to see so many friends and, yes, old friends, um, and faces that I don't know, but maybe we'll get to know you uh, as we go through the service. I have had a, a very long-standing link with this church. Um, somebody told me last Tuesday at a funeral service, and I don't believe this, but this is what he said. He said, I remember you. Your dad was preaching at Ackland Road, and he said, I'm not going to preach tonight. I've got my son, and he's going to do it. And he said, I think you were in short trousers. Well, I don't think that happened. I don't think it could have done, but um, that's what he said. But it's been a long, long time, and we look back with thankfulness to the Lord for fellowship, for friendship, and for prayerful support over the years. It's good to be with you, and uh, we're going to look at this particular passage uh, when we allow God to take control. And as I read that passage, there was one word that came to me, and it's the word revival. The word revival. And we sometimes think that that must be countrywide or maybe an area like the Welsh Revival or parts of Scotland. But also it needs to be in each one of us, doesn't it? Lord, sometimes we need to pray, revive me. And I think that's what we're going to learn in this particular chapter. We think of Samuel, and Samuel was, first of all, a man of prayer. We read that in Psalm 96. It says this, Samuel was among those who called on his name. They called on the Lord and he answered them. He was a man of prayer. And that comes, of course, in the reading that we had just now. He was also the prophet. And he went around bringing God's word to the people. Uh, We're told in chapter 4 and chapter 3, the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he he let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Persheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. So here's a man of prayer, a prophet, but when we look into this chapter, he's building an altar at the end of the chapter, he's offering a burnt offering, he's a priest, But he's also a judge. And you read at the end, or we had read at the end, Samuel continued as a judge. Quite a remarkable man. I have one book on Samuel. It's a very thin book, but it simply is called God's Emergency Man. And he certainly was for these days because that country was in a desperate state. As we come into the story here, Shiloh, where the ark had been, apparently was destroyed by the Philistines. People were obviously into idolatry, as we shall see in a moment. There was a long gap between them and God. God was distant distant in their lives. They were ignorant of living a life following closely to God. Those were the days, and Samuel was the man who came to the days. But Samuel is not mentioned in chapter 4, in chapter 5, and in chapter 6. Where was he? Was he at home? Did he have a, a comfortable chair where she enjoyed sitting in day after day, week after week? What was he doing? I believe that Samuel was going around the country bringing the word of God. We see that happened later when he went from Bethel to Gilgal to Mizpah and so on. But I believe that this was happening. And as we look back into chapter 4 and we realize that God spoke to him and Samuel's word came, it says, to all Israel. Samuel was on the move. And it's because of Samuel's preaching and bringing the word of God that things began to happen. And this is why this chapter is written. Because the people came and told, uh, and, we, and people came and mourned and sought after the Lord. Why did they do that? I believe it was Samuel's faithful preaching. When Jean and I were considering full time ministry for the Lord, and um, we were very unsure about things, a, a dear missionary couple uh, supported us, encouraged us, prayed for us, guided us 
we could almost say mentored us. They had worked for 40 years in Bolivia. And when we talked to them about their ministry, they said there was very little fruit at all. We sowed the seed. But it was such a religious country that people did not want to get into a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. Just over three and a half years ago, we were in Israel. Uh, we were at the Garden Tomb. And in the Garden Tomb gardens have various places where groups of different sizes can have communion. And my group was in one place, and next door to us was a very big group. And uh, one of the people in our party came up to us and said, uh, they're singing in my language, it's Spanish. So I said to Maria, J just go and find out where they are, where they come from. And she came back with a face beaming. They come from Bolivia. See, that person that we knew had preached the gospel. He never saw much fruit. But many years afterwards, there's this tremendous crowd, about 60 people in the Holy Land, praising God from Bolivia. That's what God does. And that's why this chapter is here, because simply Samuel, I believe, had gone from place to place preaching the word of God. So now we move on to the next slide, and I um, should do, come on, not moving, can you move it on please, thank you. Um, I'm going to use some words to help us in this revival study, and the first one is returning the right relationship with God. The people of Israel mourned and sought the Lord. What a great time that was. If we have something aside, wouldn't it be great if we could pray for our country that the people would mourn and seek the Lord? That would be revival in Britain, wouldn't it? And that's what's needed, and that's what happened here, I believe, as I said, as a direct result of what Samuel had done as he preached this. This was a sort of pattern that had happened many times in Jewish history. The people had sinned, God had punished them, the people said they were sorry, there was salvation of one sort or another by different people. And then it went back again. That was the sort of cycle that happened. And here the cycle was beginning again. They'd gone through a difficult time. They'd had the control of the Philistines over their country. And now it comes to the point where the people turn back to God. They want a relationship with God. They're returning to him. Um, and it's because of Samuel. The interesting thing is... All the people of Israel mourned and sought after the Lord. All. Every single person, it suggests to us, wanted to come back to the Lord. And this was not, in a sense, uh, just a, a few folks or just a little pocket of people. There was a concern in the nation. And they sought the Lord. And that was really the first point that I wanted to make uh, very simply. There was this returning to the Lord and because of that, um, the people were going to come into some blessing. Now, the second step um, is rebuke. It's not going to work again. I'll pass it on if you would. Um, and what happened was this. Samuel said, if you're returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourself of the foreign gods and the astros. God cannot work in your life, says Samuel, because you've still got all these idols and you'll have to literally rid yourself of them with all your heart. Not just a few words, not just um, a suggestion maybe, but definitely, sincerely, yes, we're going to rid ourselves of these idols. And this is what happened. So Israel put away their bowels and their asteros and served the Lord only. They got right with God and they rid themselves of the past and the idolatry and all that that involved and they came clean to God. One of the things that I'm involved in is a work called Bible Education Services and we've produced um, Sunday school and children's material which is used in about 60 different countries uh, in about 30 different languages. But our representative in South Africa, in Johannesburg, is a guy called Marlon. Marlon's parents, I think, were brought up in India, and then they moved to South Africa. He was brought up in, India, uh, in South Africa, brought up as a Hindu. 
And God moved in his life. First, his sister came to the Lord. He despised her. He rejected her. He would have nothing to do with her. But God worked in his life, and he came to know Christ. He's a brilliant, outstanding evangelist today. But when that happened, he tells the story. In his garden, he had this sort of idol, which everybody could see, an indication that his household worshipped as a Hindu. And before the street, he knocked the whole thing down. People saw that he meant business, and he was going to follow the Lord Jesus. That's what happens, isn't it, when we rid ourselves of the past. And most of us have got something that's there that we, we probably don't want to have. Uh, there's an old hymn that very simply says, The dearest idol I have known, whate'er that might idol be, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. Yes, every one of us have got some sort of idol, haven't we? Modern-day idols could be anything that comes between me and the Lord. And we could talk about that, couldn't we? And it'd be a variety of things if we were honest with ourselves. There are things in our lives that we, don't know, that we know shouldn't be there. And we have to, in a sense, put them away. Paul talks about putting off the old garment, putting on the new, putting off the old man, putting on the new man. It's that idea of getting rid of the past, all the filthiness and the, 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 the troubles of the past, and concentrating on the Lord Jesus, as we sang in that lovely hymn or song just now. So, first of all, returning, then removal, and now renewal. And we, we come to the next pa passage. Um, the renewal is fairly straightforward, because it helps us to understand this. This is what he said. Serve him only. And he says it again. And the people served the Lord only. This was rededication. This was renewal. This was the people saying, yes, I've done that what I shouldn't have done, but now we're going to renew our hearts and our lives in the Lord. We are going to commit ourselves again to the Lord. Can I read Romans 12? Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Whenever I read that, I think maybe every day I need to pray these words, that I will do his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That is serving the Lord only, isn't it? That is being what the people did in that day when God came first. And in the words of Matthew and chapter 6, which we know so well, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. But more than that, the idea of giving everything to the Lord and putting him first. That's what we need more than anything else in these days, a renewal, a rededication. Most of us, I guess, have, uh, remember the day when we came to Christ, but sometimes we can drift, sometimes we can wander, sometimes it becomes difficult for us, doesn't it? But maybe even today, quietly as we sit here, we renew our commitment to the Lord and we show willingly from our hearts that we want to serve him and him alone. Let's move on, shall we, from renewal to repentance. And um, we see that what happened, the, the whole assembly was in Mizpah, and Moses, uh, Samuel said, I'll inter intercede with the Lord for you. And they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. What was that? That was certainly repentance. It was the idea of literally getting rid of something, of offering something. And it's the idea of repentance. And what a need there is for that. Listen to Psalm 32. Blessed is the man whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sin is covered, who has repented. Psalm 51, remember that comes with David and his sin with Bathsheba. The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, 
O oh God, you will not despise. This is a key step in revival, isn't it? Repentance. And isn't it interesting that when John wrote his epistle, John the disciple, the apostle, he wrote, if you confess our sins, your sins, he is able and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And isn't it true that that was written particularly for Christians? If we confess our sins, he is able and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I think perhaps one of the, 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 the positive points of the, the Church of England liturgy is very often in the early stages of their services, they will seek God's forgiveness for all that they have done and should have done in the past week. They are confessing. And maybe there's more and more need for that because God can't work in our hearts if we haven't got that sense of repentance. Returning, rebuking, yes, rededication or renewal and repentance. But then what happens next? Let's go to the next slide, shall we? And uh, very clearly, this is about reliance. What had happened was this. The Philistines heard this was great gathering and they thought they were assembling to attack them. So instead of that, they attacked. And then the people said to Samuel, do not stop crying out to the Lord our God for us, that he may rescue us from the hand of the Philistines. There was a real sense in which they realized, as David has already said, that the Ark of the Covenant was not sufficient. They had to come to God, to the Lord, to pray to the God for us, that he may rescue us from the hand of the Philistines. Then Samuel took a lamb and offered as a burnt offering. He cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf, and the Lord answered him. Tremendous words, those, aren't they? And when we come to our Lord, and it's not just a little feeble cry, a little feeble talk, is it? But crying to the Lord. There, there seems to be an emotion. There seems to be urgency. There seems to be the sense in which they're so sure that only God can deal with this terrible situation that they were facing. They cried unto the Lord from their hearts. That was Samuel particularly. But the people linked with that, I'm sure. And as a result of that, God answered them. The Lord answered him. How good it was for the people to sense that real sense of which uh, the Lord was blessing them in that way, in a remember, remember, remarkable way. The burnt offering was a sign of worship and the immediate answer for prayer. And as a result of that, the Philistines drew near to engage Israel in battle. And that day, the Lord thundered with loud thunder against the Philistines and threw them into such a panic that they, rooted, they were rooted before the Israelites. There's another word for you, Chris. They were rooted before the Israelites. The men of Israel rushed out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, slaughtering them all the way to the point below Bethkar. God gives the victory. Our God is victorious. Thank God for that. And whether we think into the, word, the words of Scripture or whether we think into various situations that are more relevant to today, we always see the answer. Our God can remove mountains. Our God is powerful. Our God is great. Our God is majestic. There is nothing, nothing that he cannot do. And we think of the situation in Ukraine, and we just wonder what's going to happen next. And we don't know why it's happening like it is. And we can't explain it. But we believe in our hearts that God can sort these things. Because our God is able. And there's nothing that he cannot do. And so we just lean on him in every situation. And this situation, just one of them, this great force of the Philistines, Israel were not really cut out for victory. We don't know how long it was since they last fought against the Philistines, but maybe quite a time. They'd been defeated and defeated and defeated. And now the foe comes again. But God gives them this mighty, mighty victory. Thank God for that. And we look at the, the, the tomb, don't we, and we see the Lord Jesus risen, and we see the mighty power of God. And maybe we look at our own lives and we think, I was like this, but now I'm like this. God has changed me, worked in my life by his spirit. 
That's the power of God, isn't it? Mightily working in individuals, as in churches, as in countries, in different ways. Very wonderful when we think of what God is doing. Reliance on God. And then, of course, comes Ebenezer. And Samuel wanted to record this victory. And he builds this, uh, this stone setup there and calls it Ebenezer. Thus far has the Lord helped us. It's wonderful to think, isn't it? In our own lives, thus far has the Lord helped us. We came into county's ministry in 1973, which next year is 50 years. And Jean and I look back over those 50 years, and there's only one word that we can say, thus far has the Lord helped us. We had no idea when we stepped out in faith how we were going to exist, what we were going to do, how we were going to uh, move forward. There was so much mystery and uncertainty. Like Abraham, we went out not knowing where we were going. But God has put his hand upon us. And I don't say this boastfully. I say it thoughtfully and prayerfully and hum humbly. God has put his hand upon us. And we look back and thank God for everything that we have done through him. As we recognize the greatness of our God. But then the church. And I can't remember now how many years it was. But way back over 100 years, I think, when Acton Road was originally built and this, the work started and things have happened and hundreds of people have come through the church over the years and many have come to know Christ, children and young people. And over the years, Ebenezer, the Lord helped us. And you've got this beautiful building. The Lord has helped you. And you should thank God for that constantly. Thank the Lord for what he has done. Samuel recognized the importance of this as he raised this Ebenezer. And we all should do that. And we look back and we thank God for the opportunities and the way that God has overruled in our lives in a, a very definite way. Just let me give you one example. Um, I was with my colleague in Ethiopia and uh, we were in touch with our printers and he said, I'm hating the thought of you coming back because I know you're going to come back with orders and I'm not sure we're going to be able to cope. Because we were producing our booklets in uh, A4 size. And he said, the only way that we can cope with the amount of material you want is to go to A5. And I said, well, that's fairly easy. All we have to do is just reduce the size of the paper. But then we discovered, of course, that the space where the children write their answers was so, so small that even a child who writes very small could never write their answers with tiny writing in the space. Everything had to be completely redesigned. And just at that time, I had come to the point of saying, can't, I can't do it anymore. I've done it for 37 years. We're going to hand it over to others. And there I was with August with nothing to do. And then this great job came, and I had to edit quite a large number of lessons to bring them from A4 to A5. It was a massive job. But the Lord intervened. I could not have done that if I had been running the camps. And yet I was the only one who had something of the expertise that was needed in the team to do this particular work. God's at work, isn't he? And we look back and we say, hitherto has the Lord helped us. And of course, the old hymn says, we will praise him for all that is past. And fellow believers will trust him for all that's to come. Because we believe that we can leave off everything in God's hands and we can recognize the truth of it. We come to the next point, which is very simple. It's rest. And um, Samuel continued as judge. The Philistines left them alone. There was peace between Israel and the Amorites. And that's not a suggestion that everybody gets out their spiritual deck chairs and sits back and does nothing. What it really means is this. When you have returned to the Lord... And when you've removed that which is not right in your life, and when you've renewed your commitment to him and repented of that which has been in your life that shouldn't have been there, when you have come to that point of relying on God, then you look back and thank him for what happened, and you can rest in that enjoyment. The old hymn says this, My Savior, thou hast offered rest. Oh, give it then to me. The rest of feeling, of leading all my, leaning all myself, 
entirely on thee. That's rest, isn't it? And maybe the rest involves some difficult times and some dark times and some hard times. But if we're resting in the Lord, that's great, isn't it? And those uh, martyrs who went to um, Ecuador all those years ago sang that great hymn, didn't they? We rest on thee, our Savior and our Lord. They knew that they could just rest in the Lord. And we can do that. That's what happened in the days of Samuel. There was rest at the end. So those are the seven stages I've suggested for revival. Uh, Their rest is absolutely vital, but they help us to look at ourselves. J. Edwin Orr was a a remarkable man. I don't know if any of you have ever read any of his stories, but J. Edwin Orr, um, he traveled most of the world with only pence in his pocket. And whenever he came to a need to go to the next country, somehow or other, God provided the needs. It's quite amazing. It's almost unbelievable what happened to J. Edward Orr. But I'm going to conclude this morning by reading some words that he wrote. It's this. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O Lord, and know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me, cleanse me from every sin and set me free. I'll praise thee, Lord, for cleansing me from sin. Fulfill thy word and make me pure within. Fill me with fire where once I burned with shame. Grant my desire to magnify thy name. O Holy Ghost, Revival comes from thee. Send a revival. Start the work in me. Thy word declares, thou shalt supply our need. For blessings now, O Lord, I humbly plead. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. I'm going to pray, and then I'm just going to very briefly mention one or two things that we're involved in just at present. Shall we pray? Father God, the word of God challenges our hearts. And many of us feel like the people of Israel, far from you at times. Lord, help us to come to seek the Lord. Help us to recognize the need to establish that relationship with you, to be close and intimate. Help us, Lord, to recognize that if there are things in our lives that have to be removed, that we should rid ourselves of them. And help us to make that commitment, that rededication, to give ourselves to you and to serve the Lord only. Lord, repentance is so easy to talk about, but Lord, we need to maybe in our own hearts examine whether there's a need to repent of something that had happened. Lord, you know, we know, but we thank you for that cleansing blood of the Lord Jesus that that can cleanse each one of us when we confess our sin. Thank you, Lord, that we can look back and We can say in our own lives and in the lives of the church, hitherto has the Lord helped us. And Lord, we just look to the future. May we enjoy resting in the Lord in these days. And yet may we be committed in every way to serve in every way that we can. We ask this humbly in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Our ministry really divides into four. The first is uh, obviously this sort of thing, preaching, and most Sundays I'm somewhere. The second is schools ministry. We've been spending a lot of time over the years uh, in schools right across Dorset at various times, but uh, more recently, more locally. uh, But I've decided just now that um, the time has come to hand over most of those schools to other people who are going to take them on, and that will be a matter for prayer that the right people will do that. So this coming week, I'm going to four schools, and I'm just saying goodbye. Schools don't like that, I have to admit. But I just feel that I would rather go out when I'm fit and well and able to do the job properly, rather than have to keep on saying I can't come because I don't fill up to it today or something like that. So that's schools ministry. We're just going to concentrate on about six or seven schools in our local area, two of which I can walk to. Uh, So it's not a case of travelling Um, I don't know what it's like in Dorchester at 9 o'clock in the morning, but in Bournemouth, it is horrendous. And if you're trying to get to a school at 9 o'clock so that you're there before the children come into the school assembly hall uh, and you're battling through traffic, it's very stressful. And uh, 
that's one of the reasons why I just feel that I've come to the end of that. We also run the Dorset Postal Bible School, which is providing lessons uh, every month for children right across the country, not just in Dorset, and then my involvement with Bible Education Services. And I'll just mention one thing that you might continue to pray about. Uh, in Ukraine, there has been a, a established work for about 15 years, and they've been sending out something like 5,000 lessons every month to children all over Ukraine. Postal services have worked well. It's been a good, encouraging, solid work. But of course, all that's all gone, to, uh, gone away, and some of the people who ran it have had to escape from Ukraine. Uh, but there are people coming out of Ukraine and out of Russia into Moldova and into Romania and into Poland, of course. And many of the children come with just what they got, got clothes they got on. No books, nothing. And so we felt there was a tremendous need to help those children. And so we printed 16,000 booklets, partly in some in Russian, some in Ukraine. And they've been delivered in refugee camps in stations where people are waiting for trains or buses, wherever there are children who speak these languages who've got nothing to do, they've got the word of God to study for six months. Do pray for that. We're just looking at the possibility of doing another print run in those two countries because um, the booklets are going very quickly. But there's a tremendous need to, to work amongst the children who really are coming out of that country. Everybody's helping with humanitarian need, aid, and of course that's important, and children need food and clothing and medical supplies and so on, but they also need the word of God, don't they? And to this end, we've tried to help them, and we're continuing to help them in the future, God willing. Good to be with you. God bless you all.